gift that matters, priceless giving gifts that really matter. Now, you remember last week we started this series talking about generosity. And we talked about generosity from the standpoint that if we are going to be like God, we must be generous people. Now, let me, let me, let me make sure you understand the context of how I want to go forward here. I want to use the idea of generosity as an overarching theme for the re- next three topics we're going to deal with. Because as we deal with these next three topics, I want you to apply what we learn from God's Word in these three topics, and I want you to apply these ideas in a generous manner. In other words, if today we are going to talk about forgiveness. As we talk about forgiveness, what I want to encourage you to do, do, what I want to implore you to do, is I want you to provide forgiveness, as God would show you in His Word today, I want you to provide that generously. I want you to provide that more than just sufficiently. I want you to provide it even lavishly. Uh, The idea is very, very simple. God did not just kind of sit in heaven and say, I think you need a little bit of this. And I'll just give you, let me, you know, let me not give too much and take an eyedropper of grace and just go, there you go. God didn't do that. He poured out his love on us. He is generous with us. He is generous with us in all areas of our lives. He is generous generous with us in all areas of who he is. And in the same way, when we learn something from Scripture that we should apply because we see that in Christ Jesus, we need to learn to apply it not sparingly, but lavishly. So I want the generosity of last week's sermon to really set the context for and override the application of what we learn over the next three or four weeks, okay? So, today we're going to talk about forgiveness. And listen, if you are going to give a gift that matters, then what you need to understand is the most important thing you could give to anyone is generosity. I'm sorry, is forgiveness. I'm stuck on last week's sermon. Is forgiveness. And in fact, let let me make a point. The whole story of Christmas is the story of forgiveness and salvation. Christmas does not come. Jesus did not come so that we would have a nice, quaint little story of a cute little baby born in a manger. Jesus did not come to the earth to give us a nice little Christmas story. He did not come to earth to give us wonderful truth and sayings that we got during his lifetime. Now, we have a wonderful Christmas story. We have a wonderful truth in the teaching of Jesus we got from his life. But these are not the main reasons he came. The reason Jesus came to this earth, the reason Jesus came and walked among us, was so that he could offer us forgiveness. Forgiveness is the point of Christmas, and we miss it. Forgiveness is the gift of Christmas, and we miss it. Because what we do is we get focused on giving stuff, and you'll get so focused on generosity, the first sermon, that you'll forget about forgiveness, the main point. Because if we did not need forgiveness, Jesus would not have come in the first place. And he has given us this message, this truth, this reality of His love and His forgiveness for us, and He's asked us to do something with it. Read with me this scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Let's read this together. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this word who reconciled to us to himself through Christ and, and, you, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Can I have you replace that word in your thinking today with the word forgive, forgiveness? Praise be to God because he gave us his forgiveness and has given us The ministry of handing out his forgiveness. We were reconciled to God through Christ by his forgiving grace. And then he has called us to tell others of how to be reconciled to God through Christ through his redeeming and forgiving grace. 
Now, you might say, that seems a little, mm, I don't know, Pastor, I don't, I don't quite understand that verse. Well, I'll tell you what, let me put it in full context, because I want you to understand that we're not just overweighting this word. We're not just overweighting this idea. Let me read for you in full context what Paul had to say around verse 18. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 5. And I'm going to read for you verses, uh, verses 16 through verses 21, as long as I can still see it because I'm getting older. And um, it's getting harder. I'm going to be one of those preachers. You know those preachers that have to stop right before they read the sermon and put their glasses on and look down at the and then they take their glasses. Stop it. I said I'm going to be, not I am. All right? So, you know, I, at any rate, no, 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 so I can read this. I can do it. Here we go. So from now on, we regard, Paul writes, no one from a worldly point of view. That's an, that's an interesting and important phrase there. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You'll understand that is our key verse that we just read. Now, let's keep going. It says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, you and I, the church, he has committed to us, The message of reconciliation, the message of Jesus' forgiveness, the message of salvation through Christ Jesus, he has committed to us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now listen to this last verse. This last verse is important. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the gift and the truth of Christmas. This is the gift and the truth of this season. This season goes far deeper, quite honestly, than what we, even as the church, tend to talk about during this season. This Jesus is born in a manger that he might die on a cross. He is born in a manger that he might pay the ultimate price for our sins on a cross. Salvation, forgiveness, the washing clean of sin is the point of the Christian season, of the Christmas season. And as we come to that point, we must understand that the most important gift we can give is forgiveness. But can I be real blunt with us? We're not good at that. We're not good at that. In fact, can I just be harsh with us? As Christians, we're often less good at forgiveness than the world around us is. We're a whole lot better at condemnation than we are at forgiveness. We're much better at hellfire and brimstone than we are at grace. But forgiveness is what God has called us to. Forgiveness is what Jesus has come for. Quite honestly, our theology, if we were, if we were very practically honest about it, our theology is grace for me, judgment for you. But that's not what we're called to. Our problem, I would suggest, is that we try to be religious people still looking at the world from the world's perspective. We try to be God's people while defining the world from a worldly perspective. And we come up with the wrong answers consistently. Now, in order to illustrate this today, in order to illustrate these three points, I want to take you to three stories inside of the life of Jesus. We're going to quickly look into three accounts that have occurred in Jesus' life. And we're going to look at how he reacted to the account and how the world reacted to the account. And the question in the end is going to be, which side of this would I be on? 
Which of these statements would you as an individual use when looking at the situation Jesus found himself in? So the first one here is in Luke chapter 7. Let's read this together. Read this verse with me. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Tell you the story. Jesus is teaching and he has been invited into the home of a Pharisee. The Pharisee has invited him over for dinner, and um, we learn later in the story that the Pharisee probably, this is probably not a sincere invitation. This Pharisee is probably bringing Jesus into his house to try to trap him or figure out how exactly to uh, get an angle against him. This This is likely not a genuinely kind invitation. And so Jesus comes into the house and he's reclining at the table discussing with the Pharisee what is going on with everyone else around him. Now, what we may not understand or capture from this story is an ancient tradition that existed within Jewish culture, which is that when an important person in town would invite another important person to their house and discussions would take place, what would happen is all the doors to the compound they lived in would be left open. And so anyone from the street could just walk in, take a seat around the edges of the uh, the yard or of the courtyard or of the house even, and sit and listen to the conversation. So people were obviously doing this as Jesus is seated in the home of this Pharisee. And you see, when they reclined at a table, it wasn't like they had a table and chairs like we do today. No, he would have been reclined at the table uh, somewhat maybe like this, although probably more laid out with his feet back behind him, Jesus would have been. And he would be talking like that. As he talked, it seems that there was a woman who came in. And she was, mm, the Bible is gentle about this. She was a sinful woman. The implication is that she was a hooker. So she comes in, and no doubt she's noticed when she comes in, because this is not a large town. So everybody knows her. And so she sits behind Jesus, and she begins to weep. Pause. Jesus has just recently taught, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Likely she's heard him teach. Likely she's heard him talk about forgiveness. Likely she's heard him talk about being free from her sin. And she begins to weep because she begins to realize this man won't reject me. This man won't abuse me. This man won't forget me or toss me out. This man will offer me forgiveness. And she begins to cry and she pulls out an alabaster jar. All you really need to know about the alabaster jar is this. When she pulls out a jar that is alabaster, there's something important inside it because the jar itself is expensive. And as she cries, her tears begin to drip onto Jesus' feet. And she begins to dry her tears off of his feet with her hair. And then she takes expensive perfume that is inside this jar and pours it over the feet of Jesus, wiping then it off with her hair, crying the entire time. A beautiful image. The Pharisee does not see beauty in this. The Pharisee looks over and says, "Mm, mm, 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 mm. Who does he think he is? He's obviously not a prophet, the Pharisee said. Because if he were a prophet, he would know who it was that was touching him. And he would not let her touch him. The Pharisee is actually appalled. He's grossed out that this woman is touching Jesus. Can can you see it? Can you see him over to the side going, oh man, yeah. I need some sanitizer for my hands. He's completely freaked out that Jesus, well, of course he's not a prophet. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know that that woman was touching him, and he wouldn't let her do that. Mm. And Jesus tells a story. Can I just tell you a sidebar? Jesus always knows what's going on in your mind. I love the way Pastor Aaron said it. He always knows what tree you've climbed up. And he will find your tree. And he will look up in it and say, get down here. 
I'm coming to your house. And he begins to tell a story because they're trying to figure out why she's crying and why she's doing this. And he starts to tell a story. He asks Peter, if a man forgives debts to two people who do not have enough money to pay it, and one is forgiven this much, and the other is forgiven this much, who will be the most grateful? Peter says, I suppose the one who is forgiven more. He says, that's what you're watching take place. And the Pharisee is freaked out. Can I be honest with you? The Pharisee is the religious one in the bunch. He's the preacher. He's the board member. He's the Sunday school teacher. He's the children's worker. He's the, Lord help us all, greeter. And he's grossed out. Here's the first statement we tend to run into that really throws us for a loop. We would say something like what the Pharisee said that, what, that day. God won't forgive that. God won't forgive that. He can't forgive that. Surely God won't forgive that. Now understand, there's some kind of sin. There's some kind of sinner in every culture, in every generation that we are convinced is so vile and so horrible and so bad that not even God would want anything to do with them. Now we wouldn't say it that way. You would never actually use that phrase. God won't even forgive that. But folks, listen. We always have somebody whose sin is so gross we don't even want to touch them. The untouchables in our society, they may change from generation to generation. They may change from culture to culture. But you have to understand, this woman represents the most reprehensible, the most, the most horrible, the most difficult, the most rejected of all sinners in her culture at the moment. So vile is she considered that it literally sickens this Pharisee to think of that woman touching this teacher. Even his feet. And you say, man, I'm glad we're not like the Pharisees. Oh, but brothers and sisters. It may not be the hooker that holds that place in your life, but there's somebody whose sin you consider so vile and so reprehensible that you would recoil at their very touch. And as a church, when we do that, we do wrong. We don't follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior. You see, under each one of these statements, I've got a question there. It's sort of a question. It's true or false. I can answer this one for you. If you are saying to anyone at any point, God won't forgive that, that's a false statement. Can I give you some good news right now? There is no depth of sin to which you can fall where the arms of Christ are not so long that they cannot reach down and pull you out. There is no sin so great that the grace of God is not greater. There is no sin so horrible, no stain so deep that the blood of Christ cannot wash it out and set you free. There is no thing we can come up with that we can actually label with the phrase, God won't forgive that. As the Holy Spirit calls us, we respond. Whatever sin you would throw in this category, you need to draw it back. Whatever human being you would put in the category of untouchable, you need to understand that Christ came to set untouchables free. And let me, let me be very honest with you. In another culture and another day, you may be the untouchable one. Only by the grace of God are you not the one there now. Allow God to set you free from such poor thinking and give the gift of forgiveness. Most of us are probably not there. Most of us would say at least we would understand theologically and philosophically that God will forgive anything. So let's move to another level of thinking. Read this next verse with me. Let's go to the next story. Read this with me. 
Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Now most of you recognize this phrase. This is from Jesus hanging on the cross. He's been nailed to the cross, he's been beating, he will die soon. He is hanging there on the cross, and you'll remember they hung him between two thieves. On the one side, the thief begins to yell at Jesus and begins to uh, ridicule him, begins to pile on from the insults that are coming from the soldiers and from the crowd. He begins to say, hey, if you're God, why don't you bring yourself down? Why don't you save yourself? And while you're at it, save us too. And he starts to just ridicule Jesus as they hang on the cross. The other criminal looks at his friend across the way and says, have you lost your mind? I paraphrase. (laughs) We deserve this. We've earned this moment. But this man has done nothing wrong. I love the question he asks of Jesus. He doesn't say, will you get me down off this cross? He doesn't say, will you make everything all right? He doesn't say, will you you expunge my record? He doesn't say any of that. He says, when you enter your Father's kingdom, remember me. Just think of me. And Jesus' answer is, surely I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. See, I I told that pretty, didn't I? Time out. What? Dude, this guy is in the electric chair. If, if If this were modern times, he's strapped down in an electric chair. You don't get in there by being a Boy Scout. He's done something really bad. He's done something that deserves that punishment. He's done something that, oh, no, we can't, mm, no, we can't forgive that. This is so bad, we just need to wipe him off the face of the planet. We need to send him on to heaven and let God sort this one out. Mm. That sounds like a good church phrase. And yet Jesus says today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus says you are forgiven and you are so forgiven that when this day ends, your day will end in heaven. Think about that. That freaks us out. I'd love to tell you today that that excites us and that makes us all proud. But I got to tell you, for most Christians, that freaks us out. Every few years or so, we have a story of someone on death row who somehow, it becomes publicly known, has given their life to Christ and expects to go to heaven when they die. Every time that comes up, there are Christians, well-educated, well-known, popular, famous Christians who step and say, oh no, oh no, God would never do that. What? What? What do you mean God would never do that? See, some of you are freaking out the other way. What? God would do that? And we're called in the second phrase I'm going to throw you today. God may forgive, but I won't. God may forgive that, but I won't. God may forgive that, but that's God. And I'm not as good as God. And he might forgive you, but I'm not going to forgive you. God might forgive you, but I can't forgive you. God might forgive you, but I can't let it go. God might forgive you, but I've got a right to be angry. God may forgive you, but I've got a right to my pound of flesh. God may forgive you, but I want justice, not mercy. And can I be real honest with you? This sounds very smart. This sounds very educated. This sounds like a thoughtful statement. God is good and God is better than me. This all makes sense so far, doesn't it? And God can forgive that and praise God he can, but I'm not God. 
And we hide behind the fact that we are human to allow us to harbor unforgiveness. But I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the human to allow him or her to release unforgiveness. You, you remember our true and false? I got bad news. I can't answer this one for you. Oh, I can answer the first one. Because that one was all about God. I can answer the first one because that's all about how God would react in the moment. But the second one is about you. And some of you have spent many years harboring some anger, harboring some hurt, holding on to it. Can I be real vivid and honest with you? Warming your hands by the fire of your hatred for so long that you're afraid if that fire goes away, you will freeze. And it sounds intelligent and well thought out for you to say, God may forgive that, but I won't. But I'm here to tell you that's not what God has called us to. Now, some of you are getting mad at me right now. Some of you right now, you're keeping the spiritual face on. You're looking all spiritual and pious. You're sitting there and you're not going to let it show. But you're angry. Because you would say to me, Pastor, you have no idea what that person has done to me. You have no idea how hurt I am. You have no idea. I have a right to my anger. Hear me. You're right. You have a right to your anger. And as Americans and as human beings, you have a right to many other sins as well. But you must understand what it is. And if you choose to hold on to it, that's your choice. But I'm here to tell you that it won't set you free. It will destroy you. I'm never going to give forgiveness to that person. Look at me. Hear what I'm saying to you. They have long since stopped thinking about you. This is hurting no one but you. So it's fine. Whatever. I'm still not letting it go. Not hurting me any. Y'all do know I got one more point, right? <laughs> Read this next verse with me. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not. I need you to read it again. Let's read this one more time. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Ouch. Some of you are sitting here going, Pastor, wait. What, 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 what does that mean? What, 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 what does that mean in the Greek? Can you throw that back up there for me? It means that. <laughs> well, come on, there, there's a nuance somewhere, isn't there? No. Come, come, come on, Pastor, there, 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 there's a way you're going to, you, you could turn this a little bit for us, right? No. I have to tell you, most of you know, but some of you don't. This is not some obscure verse that I pulled from somewhere. This is the verse immediately following the Lord's Prayer. It's in the same thought. Remember the last part of that prayer? And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who... I'm sorry, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, whichever version you want to quote it from. 
The next sentence is this. You have to understand, unforgiveness costs you far more than it gives you. You have to hear me. If you've been warming yourself by the fires of your hatred, those fires, my friend, actually burn very cold. And they will not sustain you. They will not take care of you. They will not heal you. It's the forgiving, freeing, redeeming fires of the presence of the Holy Spirit that will warm your heart, warm your soul, and set you free. But those fires cause us and call us to set others free as well. The last statement, very simple. God forgives, and so do I. God forgives, and so do I. Wait, 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 wait. Before you freak out on me, before you go, Pastor, I could never, 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 never do that. Hear me. Forgiveness is not equal to it's okay. You hear me? Forgiveness is not equal to it doesn't hurt. Forgiveness is not equal to that's ah, all good. Forgiveness is not equal to let's vacation together. Forgiveness is the release of responsibility for your soul. Because when you refuse to forgive someone else, when you harbor hatred against them, hear me, you have to hear me, you give them a power over your life that is matched only by that of God Himself. But God can set you free from that. You have to let go. Some of y'all are going, come on, preacher, dag, it's Christmas. Can't you preach on like stars and angels and stuff? <laughs> this is what Christmas is all about. God is just and holy. Amen? Therefore, all sin to him seems untouchable. Were he not willing to forgive, we would all be that woman with the alabaster jar of perfume. But he chose. Now he asks us to choose. And I challenge you. What's the true statement for you? You realize it's a growing up thing. It's a maturing thing. When we're young Christians, when we're just saved, we want everybody to live in the justice and the righteousness of God and we will actually find ourselves in a place where we look at certain sins and say, God won't forgive that. And then somebody teaches us that He will and it freaks us out. And we move. We, we grow up a little bit. We get a little deeper in the faith and we say, okay, God can forgive everything, fine. But we say, God can forgive that, but I won't. And that sounds smart to us. And that sounds like we've grown up. And that sounds like we're mature. And we've taken a step because at least we have the right theology about God, but we don't have the right theology about what God expects of us. And then one day the Holy Spirit catches hold of us in a very personal way. And says, not only must you surrender your sin, what you already know to be sin, you got to surrender that anger. you got to let go of that unforgiveness. And it is a mature Christian who is able to say, God forgives and so do I. I don't recommend you check the blanks in front of anybody next to you. But I do recommend that you ask yourself and process in your own heart and mind through prayer and through what the Holy Spirit would say to you. 
What's true for you? What level are you at? And when, by the power of the Holy Spirit, do you plan to move on? It's Christmas. Let's give out some forgiveness. Father, you are the one who enables us to do so much more than we ever believed or dreamed was possible. Lord, we never dreamed that it would be possible that you would set us free from our sins. We never dreamed that it would be possible that you would deliver us from our past. We never dreamed that it would be possible that you could pull us out of, as the hymn says, that deep, miry clay. But you have. We never dreamed that you could set us free from so many of the things that used to hold us down, but you have. We've never dreamed, Lord Jesus, that you could make such a difference in our lives, but you do. So now, Father, I ask, Holy Spirit, I implore that you would bring us to a place where we can let go of anger. That you would bring us to a place where we can let go of hurt. That you would bring us to a place where we can let go of unforgiveness. Father, all across this room, men and women, boys and girls, we are struggling with forgiveness issues. Would you help us through it? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around. I'm not going to try to get you to raise your hand or come forward. I want you to focus. Holy Spirit, speak to us. What would the Holy Spirit show you right now? What anger would he point out in you right now? Father, someone in this room is really angry right at this moment with me. Perhaps they're angry with you. Perhaps they're angry with this sermon, but they're just the anger within them at the very idea of letting this go is beginning to weld up inside of them. Lord, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would leave that, set it aside. We come against that spirit of anger now. We come against that spirit of unforgiveness and we say to that spirit in the name of Jesus, it's time to go. And with the ancients who saw you, we give you praise for your presence. You came. You lived among us. You set us free. Make it true in our lives. If you need to talk to someone after this service today, there'll be folks down front. I want you to do that. This may have rocked your world. Talk to somebody about it. Let's deal with this issue. Father, you are the one who has come in the name of God, in the name of the Father, and you have come to set us free. You are our Redeemer, and we sing with the ancients of old that word that speaks of your coming. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. We lift you up. We ask you, Lord, to allow this to happen in our lives. We ask you, Lord, to set us free. We ask you, Lord, to pick us up. We ask you, Lord, to set us in a place where forgiveness can be real about us. Let us set someone else free of what they've done to us so that we can find freedom in you. And let us in that moment find that in you we are so free that we feel as if we could fly out of this place because we carry no longer the weight of our sin or anyone else's damage they've done in our lives. We lift up the God of heaven who has come not to make us captives, but to set us free, to lift us up, to carry us forward. And in the name of the Holy Spirit of God, we declare victory and we declare freedom in this place, knowing that Hosanna has come into our lives. Set us free, make us yours, and we'll give you glory for everything you do. In your name we pray. Amen.